I'll begin with the roll call. Scott Self, here. Michael York. Here. Jane Johnson. Here. Michael Day. Brandon Self. Here. Richard Lane. Sly Karazinski. Here. Steve Malone. Here. And Brian Vertigal. He is not here. So let's see. I will seat Steve for Michael York. I mean, not Michael York. I will Steve from for Michael Day. I will see Steve Malone for Michael Day. For, yep. And oh yes, I do. Yep. And we do not have another um, alternate here, so no one will be seated for Richard Lane. The agenda is will be. Re, uh, Reviewing the minutes of January 12, 2022, and regional impact vote, which we will have prior to that. Applications, public hearings, we have planning board number 22023, site plan review. Uh, this is a continued public hearing from 112. Brickstone Land Use Consultant, Consultants LLC wishes to uh, I mean, request a site plan review on behalf of Swansea Lake Campground LLC to construct a maintenance building, bathhouse, 36 full service campsites and associated site improvements on undeveloped land located on East Shore Road. Subject property is located at tax map 45, lot 22-3 in the Rural Agricultural District. <coughs> Item B, planning board number 23001, multi-tenant application. This will be a public hearing. Ronald Cormier requests to operate a, sh a shed cordwood sales business at existing commercial property at 387 Mananoc Highway. The subject property is shown at, as tax map 16, lot 20 29, and is located in the business district. Item C is planning board number 23 002. It's a site plan modification with a public hearing. SVE associates, uh, associates on behalf of Moore Technology Systems Incorporated requests a modification to their approved site plan for an approximately 3,280 square foot expansion. The subject property is shown at tax map 19, lots 97-2 and 97-3, located at 230 Old Homestead Highway in the Industrial Park District. Upon a finding that the application meets the submission requirements of the site plan review regulations, the board will vote to accept the application as complete and a public hearing may follow immediately or will be scheduled for a time and date certain. Then under discussions and other business, we have alternate member application, Victoria Rec Ames, a multi-tenant process change, possible change, suggested by EDAC, rules of procedure amendments, site plan review regulations, and any other business as may be required. So the multi-tenant item B, the multi-tenant application there, um, if the board doesn't mind or if the board agrees, we would like to move it to the first up on the list, it won't take very long, and Mr. Fippert has agreed that it's okay with him to move it ahead. Uh, anybody, any of the members disagree with that? If so, we will do that. We will take that one first. Now, the minutes of January 12, 2022. Does anyone have any uh, comments? Changes? Uh, oh, 2023, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Anybody have any comments on those minutes? If not, a motion to accept as presented would be in order. I make the motion that we accept them. Motion by Brandon Self to accept the minutes of January, January 12th, 2023. Is there a second? Seconded by Jane Johnson. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, and does anyone feel there's anything on tonight's agenda that would require us to notify surrounding towns? That would be a regional impact vote. If not, then a motion that we do not need a regional impact vote would be in order. Anyone want to make that motion for us? I'll make the motion. Motion by Sly Karazinski that nothing on tonight's agenda requires us to notify surrounding towns. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Brandon Self. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? And that is passed. So that brings us to the agendas. And like I said, we're moving item B to the forefront, and that would be planning board number 23-001. This is a multi-tenant application. 
Ronald Cormier requests to operate a shed slash cordwood sales business at existing commercial property at 387 Menanoc Highway. Subject property is shown at tax map 16, lot 20-29, and is located in the business district. And you are up. That would be you, correct? Right. Yep. Manannock Highway, and it was formerly the ground up landscape property. Um, Ron is here tonight. He's um, looking to store and sell sheds on the property and do a little firewood eventually, and possibly Christmas trees in the winter. So, you won't be doing firewood initially? Um, we have to go through zoning. Yes. Oh, you mean to process it? Are you going to be yeah. You, yeah. are you going to be stockpiling and selling it there without processing? Um, well, I guess the plan is to go to zoning and then come back to planning for that part of. It. Just do that part of it. I see. So right now it's currently just the shed. Yeah. Yeah. You selling there? Yeah. Okay. And everyone familiar with the site plan? We have the site plan in front of us here. On Route 12, you do too, yeah. And it was former ground up. He's got it listed where the parking is going to be. That small little office is still there and will remain there with parking space in front of it. Shows where the sheds are going to be. Any questions for the applicant? Uh, porta potty. That's what they've done in the past, and that's all. We'll porta potty. Do. Okay. Thank you. Any other board members have any questions for the applicant? He just said that. Yeah. And any members of the public here for this item here? Any questions from the public? If not, I will close the public hearing, which again I forgot to open in the first place, but it is officially closed. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the board can deliberate on that. Any uh, any objections? It's a pretty straightforward. It, it, yeah, looks straightforward. It's been uh, being sold on that property prior to, so uh, nothing's going to change on the property. It's remained the same. So, if any, anyone has any no object objections, then uh, the motion would be in order. <clears throat> I'll move that we accept the application for the stores of sheds. Motion no, and sales. Motion by Michael York to uh, approve the multi-tenant application. And I'll second. Second by Brandon. Yes. No, he said no. Um, that uh, no plant sales either. It was just he said just the sheds are going to be sold there. He did say Christmas trees. Oh, pos that's right, possible Christmas trees. Yep. Sorry. And he said if the wood shed, I mean, if the wood processing was going to be added later, he would go through ZBA for that and then come back here. Yeah. Great, thank you. Is there any further discussion? Then all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? And it was Brandon. All set? Yeah, you're all set. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the second item up now will be, this is the planning board number 22-023. And again, that is a, that's a continued public hearing from 112, uh, and that is a Brickstone Land Use Consultants, LLC. They request a site plan review on behalf of Swansea Lake Campground, LLC, to construct a maintenance building, bathhouse, 36 full service campsites, and associated site improvements on undeveloped land located on East Shore Road, Subject property is shown at tax map 45, lot 22-3 in the Rural Agricultural District. And we had a, a site walk on, on that uh, on Saturday, and everyone saw where the shed was going to be located. And we saw basically or approximately how far it would be from the property line of the closest neighbor. Um, 
See anybody have anything about the site walk before we get going here? Nothing. Okay. Uh, Mr. Fifford, do you have anything? Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Thank you. Um, at the last hearing in this room, not at the site visits, there were some questions raised. Um, so I tried to provide additional information to the board to address those. Um, questions were asked about are there rules that are enforced at the campground and specifically rules regarding pets. And there are written rules. I submitted copies to the board. Hopefully you received those. Um, I won't go through them all. Can Unless I there were questions. Can I hold you up for one second? I, I forgot something. Can I hold you up for a second? Sure. Uh, there was an issue. It was brought up at the last meeting, and um, Ms. Blake brought in a couple of letters. One of them was from Greg Johnson, which is Jane's husband here, and it was regarding property values and his opinion on the property values. And um, Jane was just wondering whether she should recuse herself or not, and I just asked Jane if she should, and your answer was, you know, if you feel that you can't, you know. If, uh, Actually, while my husband nor I has any pecuniary or, or personal interest involving this property or what goes on with it now or in the future, but I have been asked by the applicant to recuse myself, so for his comforts, I will recuse myself. Okay. Any of the board members have anything to say about that? Otherwise, okay. Jane is recused, and just okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's out of the way. You can continue. Thank you. I forgot about it myself. I did. Yeah. Um, so anyways, I submitted copies of the written rules regarding the camping activities and uh, pets during the, during the camping activities. And unless there's questions, um, I'll just go on to the next item I wanted to address. Any questions on the board from those rules? They were pretty straightforward, pretty self-explanatory as to what the rules are at the campsite. Yeah, how many uh, infractions have actually resulted in the expulsion of any campers in the past? Do you happen to know that at all? Or does um, the applicant know that? I know there have been expulsions. Yeah. People have been asked to remove their pets from the property, and then they were allowed to come back and continue camping. But the pets causing the violation, the noise, the dogs, um, were asked to leave the property and they were removed. Um, during the zoning board hearings, there were questions about police calls and police activity at the property. And we contacted the police department, and there was one record of a police call where they were called out. Um, there was loud music and fireworks by a camper, and uh, they agreed to stop the fireworks, and they turned the music down. But it was that one call. Um, this is in the 20 years that the Wickhams have owned the campground. So it's not a long history of violations or problems uh, that resulted from campers being there at the site. Thank you. The other question that was asked was regarding um, stormwater treatment and drainage. Uh, we initially did a 25-year design storm, and that's what was um, identified in the application that we would comply with that. I checked a 50-year design storm. Um, New Hampshire DES refers applicants to a website that's managed by Cornell University. They keep track of every rainfall event um, in many different states, including New Hampshire. So you go on that website and you can put in the location of your property um, or you can go town by town, and we use the town of Swansea, which interestingly enough is, has higher rainfall events than the city of Keene. I was a little surprised by that. But, um, so according to that Cornell University website for extreme weather events, the 50-year design storm is 5.83 inches of rain. Um, so doing the, the volume calculations, um, and I just did a very simplified approach. I took the whole rain event. I didn't subtract anything for infiltration or evaporation or um, the length of the runoff distance, none of that, which HydroCAD will do. I just looked at the raw volume numbers for that 50-year storm in a 24-hour period, 5.83 inches of rain generates 
um, just under 16,000 cubic feet of water, which is a lot of water. That's a big volume. And if we looked at the, the two ponds that I've designed on the site plan, they total a little over 18,600 cubic feet of storage. So um, that tells me they're way over capacity, even for a 50-year storm. Um, in a hydrocad program, they would look at the soil types and figure in an infiltration factor because water will be infiltrating the whole time it's in the pond into the permeable soils. They look at other things like the slope on the land and the time of concentration, which is just related to the distance the water has to travel to get there. And they can map the volumes um, during the storm event. So this is a very conservative design, exceeding a 50-year capacity. So hopefully that will, will satisfy the concerns about um, effects from stormwater runoff. So it looks then like even with a 50-year storm, uh, the stormwater would be contained on the property is what Completely. you're saying? Yes. Completely, yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, other than that, I think I'll just wait and answer questions. Okay. Okay. And members of the board have any questions on the applicant to the 50 year storm or anything like that? Anything in the site walker name? No? Nope. Nope. Then members of the public have questions on what we just heard or the entire application for that matter. And See, Miss. Um, I have it on my computer. I'll email it to Sarah. Sure. It's very interesting information, and there's a lot more information than just rainfall events as well. So, it's a good, good resource. Ms. Blake? Um, my name is Jana Blake. I'm at 111 East Shore Road. I am the closest abutter at map 45, lot 22 floor. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank all of you that attended the site walk from the planning board as well as from the public. I do appreciate everyone coming out and taking a look at the property from my vantage point, as well as where the proposed campground maintenance building is going to go. Uh, one thing I would like to bring up is that the, the current representation. OK, I just talk loud. <laughs> The, um, you know, the current representation of the snow on the trees and everything else isn't realistic to what it would look like. I mean, the snow-laden branches pulled everything down. It buffered sound. It buffered views. It made things not realistic. What cannot be denied, however, is the absolute proximity to my home. Just a few short steps through the woods, and you're in my yard. My driveway length and current undisturbed views of trees and surrounding hills, obviously the driveway is significantly longer than most driveways, quarter mile long to be exact. I was forced to fix my driveway where it is because of grade, because of wetlands, and I complied by all that to build the house where it is located. I know there's some concerns about grade and how that is going to impact the campground. It's very steep. You guys drove up it. There's points where it, it's quite steep. But in order to build a house where I did, I had to put my driveway there. I had to come over to that side of the property to make it so that I could actually put the house up there. I obviously have privacy concerns. Jim Fippard vehemently denied any sort of buffer and has asked for full exclusion to the landscape plan. 
I also have safety concerns. Currently, my driveway has two driveway alarms, plus I actually have a camera on my garage. I don't want to have this, but I have to have this. I have actually had people come to my house that I did not want on my property. And I had to have that so that I could protect myself and my daughter. Campers are transient people, typically. This isn't your everyday backyard barbecue friend that lives in your neighborhood. These are people that come from away places that you don't know. This is people, you have no, no idea what their history is. You have no idea if it's a criminal. So you're saying to me, or Jim Bifford is proposing, that I be okay with this. That I be okay with having 144 plus or minus people right there within just a couple short steps through the woods to my house and my property. How am I supposed to protect myself from these people? I bet my, my house back that far as a buffer, not expecting this prop this campground expansion. Obviously there's noise concerns. During the site walk I played some sounds. These are typical sounds that you would hear. You're gonna hear barking dogs. Yes, they have rules in place. But how long does it take for that rule to be enforced? How many chances do they get? Those little clips of barking dogs that I played were 36 seconds long. 36 seconds. How long does it take them to get from the main house down by the camp, by the lake up there to enforce something like a barking dog? You have car alarms going off. There's nothing to stop from setting off the car alarms. That just happens. You know, you reach into your key, into your pocket, you hit your button on it, car alarms go off. With the maintenance building, you're gonna have the issue with the compressor running. Not to mention that there's gonna be a disruption to the existing wildlife on the proposed campground expansion site, as well as to the wildlife trails that abut that proposed expansion site. This is a rural agricultural zone, not a commercial zone. There is actual proof. I submitted that at the last planning board meeting of devaluing of property. It will occur should this expansion be approved, especially given the proximity to my house. The existing septic is not being updated. Why is it acceptable for, you know, he talks about the storm drains and the ponds and all of that. Why is it acceptable for the leach field to abut the retention pond? I believe the leach field should be at least 100 feet away from any body of water, regardless of whether it's man-made or not. Kids are going to go to those retention ponds. They're going to play. So if the leach field is that close to the retention pond, who knows what's in the water? Additionally, there is going to be a draw on the aquifer that my well is on. It's already a fragile, fragile ecosystem. As I stated in the January 12th meeting, sediment already plugs my screens and filters in peak season. As the aquifer is drawn down, the sediment in the water becomes more concentrated. This already happens. 36 campsites with full hookups, showers, all of that is going to have an impact to that well. The master plan, again, I want to refer to a handout that I gave out during the January 12th meeting. This is from the natural resources section under water resources, surface waters and waterways. Water is a critical resource to support the health of local ecosystems as well as being a resource for drinking, recreation, agricultural and industry. It 
It is important, this is on page 44, it is important to recognize that natural resources also contribute to the quality of life for our residents and play an integral part in defining community character. Streams, rivers, walking trails, mountains, working farms, forests, wildlife, and open land all contribute to making a place unique and special to its residents. Obviously, there's many concerned residents here. A sustainable community recognizes the importance of these natural assets and takes steps to protect them. On page 49, development around Swansea Lake and Wilson Pond is primarily limited to single family residential dwellings. Swansea Lake and Wilson Pond provide important environmental, recreational, economic, and aesthetic value and the town should continue using existing regulations and investigate new methods for protecting these resources. Just a reminder that this expansion is slated to be placed directly between two of Swansea's most valuable natural resources. You have Honey Hill, in Swansea Lake. There will be significant impacts to these resources that will not be harmonious to the existing surrounding neighborhood as well as to the lake. We will see an increase in E. coli and other algae blooms due to increased bather load. RSA 674 from New Hampshire. It will, it will go against securing the safety from fires, panic, and other dangers. D, to provide adequate light and air. E, prevent an overcrowding of land. Avoid undue concentration of, policy, of population. And then H, to assure proper use of natural resources and other public requirements. I do have a question, and I would like you to please address Mr. Fippard. Do the owners plan to sell? You're asking him now, are you, are you done? Are you done? I'm asking you to please. Yeah. Okay, do the owners plan to sell, Mr. Fippard? Is listed for sale. When it first came in, we applied for a special exception for zoning for it. We really had no intention of selling it. And when the family retired, we had a house on the front lawn directly in front of the expansion area for the house. And so after the hearings, the way it went, the way they were treated, they felt disrespected. And they were very upset. After every meeting, they were kind of Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. And also, I may point out if, if the property of any property can be sold, anybody can list their property on the market. And if this particular property were listed for sale and this wasn't being discussed tonight, it was just an open piece of land, 
they could do the same thing applied to the ZBA for a special exception to extend that camp up ground up there. And they also could put that maintenance building within 20 feet of the property line up there as they're allowed to. They could have more campsites up there as well because they'd be able to move closer to the property line. But I'm just bringing that point up that even though they maybe they want to sell the property, that could be, but they have listen to the neighbors and they have reduced the number of campsites campsites from 51 to 36 and they have kept that maintenance building 100 feet rather than the 20 feet that they could so i'm just bringing that up continue so is this approval is it contingent on the sale of the campground is the approval contingent on a sale I, they'd have to have a buyer i would think so would you answer that? <clears throat> no buyer. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And as you stated before, um, any new owner would have to abide by what was approved if it's approved. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so if it does sell, there's no guarantee that these new owners are going to run the campground the same way as Bill and Jill have been running it. And there's no promise that there's not going to be increased calls or that they're going to put in, enforce the same rules for barking dogs. So I would just like the board to please consider that as well. And we will, we take your considerations into consideration. You know, we listen to your views, we listen to everyone's views, and we're glad that you come to our meetings and express those views. Sometimes uh, things are brought up which the board doesn't realize. But also, you know, whether, whether their opinion or based in fact, the planning board does listen to them, and the planning board does take it into consideration. But when the planning board is making a decision, they can't base a decision on opinions of what could happen or what might happen, they have to base their decisions on, on things that have happened or will happen, and that being based on or backed up with fact or, or evidence. So I'm just letting you know that we are listening to you, and that's fine that you bring all these views up, and they are good views, but again, as far as we'll say, for example, the, uh, the property value on there, um, those are opinions of real estate agents it's not an assessment done so that really isn't fact or or uh, something to back that up with it would have to be an assessment and the case i suppose could be made of the one in winchester that yes that one didn't sell because of the campground being by that one but again if if this were being heard in winchester maybe that would have made a difference but this is swansea and, and you know that's not evidence that it'll happen here you know those types of things and yeah your concerns over noise noise does carry, but I think um, you might have thought as well as the rest of us that uh, that building was going to be in a different location because when we went to take a look at the, uh, the staked out area there on the site walk, it looked like the building was going to be over where it was a fair and not really clear, I wouldn't say clear, but there was sparse growth there. But actually, in fact, it was down further. You know, when we all walked down and actually saw where the building was going to be, it was down further and there is somewhat cover. I know there's snow on the trees, but there are some evergreens over there and, and things in the way. And again, it's the 100 foot buffer over there. Um, you probably don't feel any better about that, but at least knowing where the building is, you probably don't feel any worse about it. Or do you? I don't feel good about any of it. No. Honestly, because that short distance you guys walked is a very short distance through the woods. It is. I, and I agree. People yeah. are going to explore. I have had people from the current camp campground that's over 700 feet away walk up to my property and steal wood off my landing. Yeah, Armloads of wood off my landing. That's not something I can control. I can't be at my house 24 seven acting it. Yeah, but again, um, it could happen, but will it happen? You know, we have to look at things that- I understand, I'm just asking you to please take it into consideration. We will. We do. Me and my daughter live there alone. 
It is my home. And, and it's a beautiful home. You've done a nice job up there. That's a, it's a really nice house up there. And I would like to continue to protect my home, protect myself, protect my daughter, yeah, and I maintain understand. its value for as much as I've worked for that and put into it. Yeah, it's obvious that you have. Yeah, you care about it a lot. Um, One final question I'd like to ask you all to think about after going on the sidewalk. If you were the abutter, how would you feel about the expansion affecting your home, your neighborhood, your property values, and your neighbor's quality of life? Because this is going to impact all of us. It's not just me. It's going to impact all of Swansea Lake. There's going to be increased traffic. There's going to be increased bather load. There's going to be shutdowns to the lake for E. coli. It's going to happen. It's going to increase. That is a no. It's going to happen. That's not just a guess. It's going to happen. In light of these arguments, again, I ask that the planning board deny Swansea Lake Campground expansion as it goes against everything outlined in the natural resources section set forth in the master plan to protect these resources as the zoning board erred in approving the special exception based upon these factors alone. Just a word about the master plan that you're quoting, and that is that the master plan is a non-binding document. You might say the zoning ordinance is a binding document where we have to go by what's in the zoning ordinance. The master plan is what the planning board uses to uh, when they're discussing zoning and changes in town as to what the master plan guides the town. So when the planning board is considering zoning, they go by the master plan as to what to do or what not to do. Um, it's advisory. I understand. It's just okay. guidelines. Yep. Yep. But I'm okay. just asking you to please consider it. We will. We do. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Ms. Blake? Yes. Yes. Is the property being listed as is or as proposed or both ways? And that question is for Mr. Fippard? Yes. That's what I was, I thought it was a question for you. Uh, Okay, thank you. Um, I read the list and my understanding is the property is being sold as is with a valid permit for ZBA approval to allow an expansion subject to planning board approval. Okay, the listing says subject to planning board approval. Okay. Any other questions from the board members? Or actually, I can't get Jane, but anybody else? No. Any uh, oh Yes, Mr. Fipper. I think I'd like to respond to some of the issues that were raised. OK. Um, we've heard it all many times now, several times, just in front of this board. Also back at the zoning board. The issues of noise and smoke and effect on property values raised and discussed at the zoning board. It's one of their criteria and consideration to grant a special exception. And they voted that it did not diminish property values. It was a three to two vote. Yes, it was a close vote. But then it was challenged in Superior Court. The Superior Court upheld the ruling and agreed to the ZBA. It was challenged again in the New Hampshire Supreme Court. And the New Hampshire Supreme Court agreed with the lower court ruling. So that issue is resolved. It's not an issue for this board to consider in approving or denying the plan. It's not one of your criteria. So this is, I don't think it's fair to keep going over and over and over and over an issue that's been settled and approved by the court. I also want to point out that if you look at this site, 12.2 acres. site is 12.2 acres of land. We're disturbing a total of about 1.25 acres. So that's of the area on the property. The rest of it is not being altered or disturbed. So I think that's an indication that they are very respectful of the environment and the conditions on this property. As the chairman mentioned earlier, and thank you for that, Setbacks on this side property line for structures is 20 feet. And they could have proposed building this building 20 feet from that property line, which meant cutting a lot more trees. Um, out of respect for their neighbors, not just this neighbor, um, they agreed to a larger buffer. They agreed to the 100-foot buffer 
and to leave this area undisturbed. So there'll be no tree cutting. We won't be cutting the underbrush. We're going to leave it in its natural state. It won't be used for storing logs or firewood or other material. And they're going to keep it to the area that we've identified on the site plan. And I think that's an important fact for the board to recognize. This is they're entitled to use their land. They're paying property taxes on this property, and they want to be able to use it. So for them to propose a modest impact as they're proposing, I think they're being more than reasonable. And I don't think that they're being recognized for that, certainly not by the abutters. As, as far as the lake is concerned, um, this will bring more people to the area that will have the ability to go down and use the lake. They're not adding any boat moorings. They're not adding any um, dock space. So there, there won't be additional boats brought in necessarily by any of these new users unless there's a space available. And people that are renting a campsite will ask up front, can they bring a boat? And all the um, dock spaces and moorings are already taken, which I believe they are every year. Um, they're they're going to be told, no, you can't bring a boat and store it here. If they have a canoe or a kayak, they can certainly bring that and carry it down to the water. So I don't foresee that this is going to destroy the lake. And I think all of that is just greatly exaggerated. And, and most of you probably appreciate that. They're very sensitive. They want to protect the quality of the lake. They want to protect the quality of the lake. It's an important resource for them as well. That's what's drawing people to their campground because they want to be able to enjoy the view of the lake, enjoy the water in the lake. So I don't think there's a reasonable concern saying these people are going to destroy the lake. The campers are being characterized, I think, unfairly as potential criminals. Uh, we don't know who they are. They're transient. They're bad people. And I think that's grossly unfair. I, and I don't need to go on and on on that. I think you understand that. Um, I've done work on Spofford Lake, all around the lake, Granite Lake, Silver Lake, Swansea Lake. And it's always like this. The people that live there now don't want anybody else to come. They don't want any changes on the lake. They want to protect the water quality. No more boats, no more people. And I can understand that. Personally, I never want to live on a lake because I've seen too much of this, go on and on and on, and the neighbors fighting and complaining, um, and it can't be pleasant for you either. I think we all want that lake to be a pristine resource. We all want to enjoy it. I grew up in Keene, lived here for 70 years, been to the Swansea Lake many, many times, always enjoyed it, and I hope it remains a good quality lake forever, and I, and I know you do too. So I think that the Whitcombs have done a wonderful job respecting the rights of the neighbors, going the extra mile to have oversized our stormwater system so that we're not dumping stormwater into the lake. All this goes in this direction, and we're storing it all on site. And I gave you that additional information today. The existing well is across East Shore Road on the main property. We've shown it on this plan. Fabulous well, 20 gallons a minute. They have it tested every year for water quality. Um, there's never been a problem, never been an issue with the water quality on the well. They have two existing septic systems, one here, which was approved and constructed, I think, in 1999, approved for 2,475 gallons per day. They built a new septic system in this location on the campground, which handles most of the sites that are here. I think only 18 of these sites go into that older system. And this is the system that seems to be causing all the concern. If the board feels it's appropriate, um, place a condition on the approval requiring that they get an up-to-date inspection of that system to prove that it's in good standing. And if it does need improvements, obviously they're going to make them because they don't want to um, lose the ability to use it. But at 2,475 gallons a day allowed here, 
This one was designed and approved for, I think, 1,480 gallons a day. Um, so you're looking at over 4,000 gallons a day of capacity. Then we're going to add a new system in this location, um, which will service the new sites, the 36 sites. So I don't think you're going to see a deterioration of the, of the soil conditions requiring replacement of the leach field. But if the leach field is failing, there's a problem with it. They're not going to have a choice. DES is going to require them to come in and repair, make the repairs or replace it. Um, and they have the ability to do that. We submitted evidence in the form of a letter from Dale Freihofer, um, who's a licensed septic designer, who did the test pits, looked at the soils, determined the safe nitrate loading, and this will all comply. So the soils are really good out here, even better across the road going toward the lake. Um, and they're well within the state guidelines for nitrate loading. So, so we comply with all that, and it's more important for them to stay in compliance with all that. Otherwise, they're going to lose their ability to operate a camp. So I don't take that issue lightly. I know you don't either. I think the butters are underestimating the property owners on whether or not they're going to operate their systems properly. There's there was concern that the new campers from this area um, would come over to enjoy the lake and then use the restrooms here and they'll overtax the capacity of this campground. And if you look at the um, data, that I think I submitted it to the zoning board, not to this board. They monitored their water usage with 108 campgrounds and the existing buildings for five years and submitted that data to the state, they average 10 gallons per day water usage per campsite. So that's a little over 1,000 gallons a day. That's, that's water being drawn from the well. That's the most common way to estimate what's your load going into your sewer system, is how much water are you using, which ends up discharged to the sewer system. So they're way under the design capacity of what's existing. If there are 144 people, I keep hearing that number, I'm not sure where that came from, um, that end up here. Um, it's the, the data, the meter readings show each of these sites will average 10 gallons a day, another 360 gallons a day that can end up into the septic system. So we're not, we're not even halfway at the capacity of what this was approved for. And, and the state granted the license to operate it at that level. And in your application to the state, they accepted that water usage data? Did I read that someplace in there? Yes. New Hampshire DES accepted that. Um, if you design a new campground and just go by the state guideline, they say to use 60 gallons per day per campsite. If you want, if you feel that's an unreasonable number, and we did, then they say, give us data that shows the water usage will be less than that. So they'll allow this to be this design to be reduced to 30 gallons a day, even though that's probably truthful what the reduces will actually be. So and that's what you base that leach field on, then the 30 gallons a day. You're saying the new design the new from Fryhofer yeah. will be using 30 gallons a day. Okay. Um, and obviously that requires state approval, mm -hmm. um, and that should be a condition if you choose to grant the approval here. Um, I think I covered it, unless there's more questions for me. And you, uh, board members, you have questions for Mr. Fibbard? No one does? Okay. No one has any questions for Mr. Fibbard? Then I will ask the audience if they have any other comments to make on this, because we're getting ready to close the public hearing. Uh, Bruce Bergstrom, West Shore Road. Bruce Bergstrom. So, um, yeah, I, I was just listening to the applicant about talking about the, uh, the current owners, their their care of the property. But I, I think it's, we're, we're at the point now where it's really just about money because the applicant is selling their property and this is going to enhance their value. So that, that that's what this is about. They're gonna they're gonna be able to get more economic value with this approval. But so. I, I think we're beyond it's their right to do that, though. Oh, I didn't say it was, but I'm just. But again, he was saying he was talking about their care of the property. They're selling, so so I'm just responding to 
his, his appeal to your... And I don't want you to lose your train of thought, but as I brought up before, I don't know if it were that, then if it were me, I would go as many campsites on there as I possibly could, move that shed within 20 feet if I was going for the economic part of it. Well, but they had they, to get they it. They, but they had to get it by the old, uh, by, the, by the original the, the zoning board, uh, kind of curtailed that down to what it is now. I don't know. If they had um, um, they kept the original plan. So they, they, yeah, they, they, they. It sounds like it came out of the uh, the uh, neighbors uh, at the zoning board of adjustment uh, put up a fuss about it, and I think that's well, why they it, brought it down. It was down. what they needed to do to get approved. It appears. Well, not necessarily. No, I can't put it that way because they they are allowed to. Put something within 20 feet there, but I. I well, I know, but well, you were you were just but you were also making an assumption that they were just being neighborly. So I guess we just don't know. Yeah. Yep. So I, I don't know. continue. Right. Jimmy. So um, yeah, I lost my train of thought, but I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll grab it. I'll grab it again. Okay. So um, um, oh, so one one of the things is uh, the the master plan is was driven by the planning board. This 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 group here here. We've had like three years of meetings. I, I, yeah, I saw a responsibility to update it every Dozens and dozens of meetings. So, I mean, you, you drove that, doc, that, that document and then it's, it's a guideline for you. So I would just ask relative to that, because I think this is uh, one reason for, for rejecting this, is when is the last time in the last 25 years have the, has the planning board approved something that would impact the lake like this when you're putting 144 bathers, people using bathrooms on the lake? I don't think there's been any approval in decades that would impact that would impact the lake to that degree is that significant uh, not to my knowledge but again it's conjecture it's it's someone's opinion as to what's going to happen to that lake with uh, we'll say 144 people or whoever it's saying there it's it's nothing solid you can go on that right well, which will get me to the next point so the um so both you and and the applicant have talked about these about um, how it affects um, Janet's property, her property value. And so each side, it's kind of like, it's kind of like management consulting. You basically hire people to give you the answer you want. So each side, each side has their, their answer. So, but it, it, it seems that it's, um, they're, they're trying to do that to drive basically a, a dismissal of that, that, um, that concern. So because at the end of the day, one of them is right. Either it's going to impact their property value, which would be a cause for rejection, or it doesn't, and, and it's not a concern. But it is one or the other. So, you know, we talk all about opinions, but that's that's what, that's up to you to decide. Is it? I mean, you walk the property. Does, does it impact their value or not? Not with not with the assessments, though. I, again, I, Mr. Fipper brought it up, and I'll bring it up as well. That was gone over by the Zoning Board of Adjustment, which is that's one of their criteria, and. Uh, the the planning board doesn't have the authority to override a ZBA judgment. ZBA judged that it would not af affect the property values. The ZBA has the authority to override a planning board's judgment if it has to do with zoning, but not the other way around. So if it's been decided with the ZBA, and I guess with the courts too, with ZBA, then it's been decided for the planning board as well. Well, yeah, because the, I mean, the, like uh, Janet said, that they lost kind of on a technicality because she brought her information on her valuation uh, decline after they couldn't reintroduce the new evidence. So, you know, did lose on a technicality. It wasn't necessarily that they judged that information. Well, they probably would have asked for uh, an assessment, you know, rather than just the opinions of two real estate people. Well, I think, um, yeah, so I, so, I guess, so I guess what you're saying is it comes down to if there's some, some significant event or, or, or approval that, that would impact, that could impact the lake with 144 people, all the issues associated with that, that if it's unprovable, which, you know, these are, these are judgments, that, that, it, that you can't make it, you can't reject anything? I, I, I guess it's just kind of interesting. Well, again, the planning board goes on facts and evidence. Really, it's, it's like a jury, like a court in that regard. Um, you can get, as you would say to yourself, you can get opinions on both sides, either way. You know, you have to base things on fact and opinion. It might not be popular for anyone out there or us too, but that's what we're charged to do. So I guess it's up to each member to decide if they feel that uh, those opinions are, are enough to carry the day or not carry the day. Um, 
And that's not what I said. I'm saying the planning board needs to use facts and evidence to decide something. We'll say you're talking about property values. Um, if we were looking at it, although the ZBA does, we'd be going on an assessment from an assessing company, not by an opinion by, we'll see, a real estate agent. No, I'm saying that's that's a fact. That's so, evidence okay. that you can look at. Well, so, uh, well, okay. so you're telling the other members how to. Oh, all right, fine. fine. All right, thank the you. The other thank members you. have a mind of their own. They can speak for themselves. Exactly. So you're speaking for yourself. Exactly. All right. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Bryant Robertson, uh, 110 Bradford Road, Keene, also a property owner on 71 West Shore Road. Um, the first thing I want to point out is uh, you have the right to deny them the ability to have fire rings on each campsite. It's in your site plan review regulations that you have a right that they're supposed to impose pollution control, which and it says here, uh, I've lost it. Uh, let's see, it's after elimination. But anyways, they're not supposed to put smoke into the air or cause noise or other things that will offend the neighbors, basically. And you have the right to require pollution controls to be put in place to control smoke. There's no way to control smoke from a fire pit other than just saying, you can't have one. And so if you do approve this, I would ask you put the restriction that there be no fire rings or fire pits allowed on those sites. I also don't see any place where there are uh, keeping their dumpsters. Are they planning to put dumpsters on the site? Because that's not represented anywhere on the plans I've seen. And, oh, what was the other one? Um, oh, in their maintenance building, are they gonna be storing hazardous materials? Are they gonna have an outside fuel tank, above ground, below ground? None of that's called out for. I would ask that you ban any underground or outside fuel storage tanks because it is a threat to the aquifer and to the wetland down below, even though he's got a flood control or rain control, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and to correct Mr. Fipper's statement at the last meeting here is there are culverts that go under the road on the adjacent property right below where they're going to put the campground which is also owned by the campground owners. So, And that's in regards to the water runoff from the property as you're talking about the culverts? Yeah, because we were talking about the West wetland and he said that the only culvert is internal on the property where a road was built. There's at least three culverts that go from, from, that, from the east side of the road to the west side of the road, which is the lake side. Two of them are right below the wetland that's below the, the proposed campground expansion. So they, they that all feeds directly into the lake. But the, okay, but the reason for the drainage plans on these plans that the planning board asked for, not right. necessarily this one, but all of them, is to make sure that there's gonna be no runoff from the property. And he's right, but, demonstrated but I'm not talking about water here. I'm talking about gasoline or diesel. And that spreads through the ground like crazy, especially ethanol in gasoline. You can't control it with a drainage ditch or a drainage pond. It's going to go where it wants to go, which is downstream. Yeah, but it's a stretch. You know, it's not like no, they're building a gas It's not a stretch. I've been in the gasoline business since I graduated from college. Gasoline travels. It goes. It moves. I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. But So it's, it's not a hypothetical. If there's a spill, it's going to the lake, because that's where the grade goes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Jeffrey Lapid. I live on West Shore Road. I would like to address fact. New Hampshire DES awarded Swansea Lake the Watershed Assessment Grant. 
grant will assess the health of the watershed. Factors include VLAP measures, septic system evaluations, other pollutant sources, and load estimates. If the planning board approves the Swansea Lake campground expansion, then you're adding an unknown variable that will confound the findings of the grant assessment and make the grant assessment invalid. It's like the planning board considering a small housing development on the lake while simultaneously trying to assess the current health of the lake. And then before the assessment is done, you start building the housing. Logically, this makes no sense. What we can do is assess the current health of the lake the watershed as planned. And then based on those results, ask the environmental consultant group to give their assessment of the impact of the campground expansion that it would have on the health of the watershed, given the current findings. My recommendation is for the planning board not to approve the proposed expansion until we have the data with environmental consultants and the finalized grant assessment. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I know Southwest already chimed in on that and said that that uh, is, will have no regulatory authority when it's done anyway. You know, it's data. It's data. Of course it's data, but again, we're going, we're going on facts and evidence. If it had authority to, to do something, or the planning board could take that into consideration. I know data is good. Data is good for everyone. But just it's a logical approach. OK, thank you. Thanks. Secondly, uh, in terms of the, the campground being treated disrespectfully, um, they have never come to a Swansea Lake Protective Association meeting to discuss concerns of this with the homeowners on the lake. I don't never come on the same thing. And uh, I live next to, this is regards to Janice's point about people will travel on her property. I, I live next to Camp Squanto, Pilgrim Pine. And weekly, kids are on my property. It's just meandering around and looking. And the only campground is going to do the same thing because so humans are curious. So, yep. Probably so. Kirsten Lang Kunick, 208 East Shore Road. L A N G hyphen K U N I C K. I respectfully request that the planning board deny the waiver to allow the 10% grade. I know there are instances, as you discussed at the site walk, that the board has allowed this in previous cases. However, the grade being directly adjacent to wetlands that are in turn adjacent to Swansea Lake, a community resource, should be a factor. Allowing this waiver could have a direct impact on the conservation efforts of the lake. Please do not put the interest of any one homeowner or business over that of a community resource that is enjoyed by all Swansea residents. Thank you. But they have addressed concerns of drainage on that property. I'm just bringing that up again. Yep, I understand that, and thank you for bringing it up. But I do need to bring up that that waiver is requested from the road agent for the driveway. And it's a waiver due to the desire based on a fact that is in your purview. If we had a denial from the road agent that they wouldn't allow it, then yes, that would be a fact. The planning board does not have the ability to. That's on the road agent to do the 10% waiver. And that's for the access road. Well, I don't know why he's asking for me. Uh, maybe he didn't really. We can't grant a waiver for a regulation that the planning board does not have in the site plan regulations. Are you waiting to go up and speak? Okay, thank you. Joe Parisi, 41 West Shore Road. I first have a couple of housekeeping things. At the last meeting, the applicant agreed to a couple of conditions, or not in conditions, a couple of follow-up items, one of them being to redo the HydroCAD model uh, for a 50-year storm. And the other was an agreement to test the 
one of the existing septic systems. Has that, uh, the results of those two things been submitted to the planning board? He, the applicant just gave, or Mr. Fifford actually just gave testimony about the 50 year storm. And uh, that they checked with that and he did his calculations on that without any uh, regard to uh, infiltration or anything like that. And it passed it for the engineering calculations. As far as the septic uh, system goes, um, that would be a condition if the board approves it and wants to put a condition like that on it. That that uh, septic system, and that would be on the west side of East Shore Road, would have to be certified. If you made it a condition of approval, yeah. how do you know it? You know, what's success? Um, success is a letter from a septic designer stating under his license that that septic system is certified and, and will operate. If it does not, then it doesn't meet the approval or that condition. With a septic system of that type, there are going to be grades. It's going to be gray. It's not going to be black or white. So if you, if you were to approve it with that as a condition, as a planning board, I don't know how you ever determine whether the condition was made unless it is with flying colors. So I, I see your concern, but again, that is all that any of us have to go on, our experts. No, no, you can, you can make it a, a prerequisite that you don't make it a, a, a condition of appro on approval. You don't, you, don't, you don't approve it until that work is done. You have the ability to do that. Yeah, we do have the ability to do that. Um, generally, something like that would be done because it has, the, as a condition, because it has the same effect. If any one of the conditions on a site plan that the planning board has um, does not meet whatever the criteria is there, then the project does not go through. But again, uh, a condition of that type is not black and white. They're going to be shades of gray. So I would encourage you, if you're really serious about protecting the lake and requiring a test of the existing system, you don't do it as part of a conditional approval, and you require that up front. You have the ability to do that. And to relinquish that ability is putting the lake at risk. Thank you. We aren't relinqu relinquishing anything on that regard. Oh, yes, you are, Mr. Chairman. Okay. You're pushing your agenda. The other item I'd like to bring up, you repeatedly talk about things being a matter of conjecture, things being not supported by data. This board has the ability to collect data through the watershed assessment. That's going to be something, a report, whether it's binding or not, which you seem to fall back on a number of times, whether it's binding or not isn't important. It's data. Why would you relinquish the ability to collect more data and not wait for that work to be done before rendering a decision? Why would you, I ask is it a real question, not rhetorical, why would you Consider approving this without the benefit of that data. You're the one who keeps on saying you don't, no, you don't want a conjecture. You don't want opinion. You want data. Here's the ability to get data. Why not wait for it? Because, like I said before, um, that document, when it's done, it'll be data, but it'll have no regulatory authority. I don't give a shit whether it has regulatory uh, ability or not. It's data. You're the one who wants data. I understand that, but my point about that regulatory authority is that the planning board would not have authority to deny on something that had no regulatory authority. Oh, I've served on a planning board for six years, and that's the first time I've heard that crutch. Well, stick around here for all years or more. I don't know. No. I cannot fathom with a planning board that has created a master plan that includes protecting the lake would not wait for that data. Whether it's binding or not, it's friggin' data. Okay. Wait on it. Thank you. Anyone else have some comments? Yes, sir. Um, Bryant Robertson, 110 Bradford Road, Keene, also Swansea Lake. Um, I got a point of order kind of question. Um, 
when when it comes to you passing the buck off to the road agent or the fire chief to get things done after you've given a conditional approval where can the public appeal the decision by the road agent or the fire chief or whoever you pass the buck to how do we appeal their decision well decisions we'll start with the planning board uh, decisions made by the planning board that someone feels goes against some well, of the... I, I understand how the planning board appeal works. Okay. How do I appeal the road agent's the decision? Selectman, the selectman's office. But they are his but, boss. But here's the thing. I only have a certain amount of time after you guys have made your decision to file an appeal, right? You have 30 days. And so at what point... So the road agent... 29 days down the road, says, okay, I'll waive the 20 foot or the, the grade or whatever. I'm screwed. No, no, you're not. The, um, we're talking about that being a condition, we'll say. Whether it's going to be a condition or not, we'll, we'll talk about it being a condition. If that's a condition of a site plan that's approved, then when that condition is met, when all the conditions are met, that's when the 30-day clock starts. It doesn't start. So it's not, not when you make your decision. No, the conditions have to be met. Then there's 30 days to appeal it. All right. But that's my understanding. To, but to appeal the road agent, first I got to go to the selectman, or do I go to the court, or do I come back here? Where do I go? If you're appealing the road agent, then I I would say you go. Well, to but it's part of your decision. If you're appealing the planning board, you either go to the ZBA if it has to do with zoning, or you go to the superior court if it has nothing to do with zoning. That's how you do it. Yeah, but, yeah, but we, can we can appeal your ruling, ruling can't we? Back course. to this board. Of course. Right? You so appeal how it do to I bring courts. it back to you? You appeal it to the courts. So, all right, so it goes direct to the courts. It doesn't come back here like ZBA. Unless it's under a zoning ordinance. Unless we've made a mistake with zoning ordinance, then it goes to ZBA. All right. So is the 10% grade or the 20-foot wide road, is that zoning? That's zoning. So then it would come back. It would come back to the ZBA. To the ZBA. Yeah. All, right. All right. So, so I, would I would suggest that you don't make getting a waiver a condition. I'd say you, if you get, a, we don't want you to get it. This is what we're going to require of you is to stick with the standard. You know, don't allow them to go get a waiver because that's just what's the point of the rule if you're going to just allow waivers. And I read a response to the request for the grade or the, it says, well, if they can get their trailer up the hill, then I guess I can get my fire truck up the hill. What kind of conditions are that? What kind of decision is that? That's not based on fact. I think that's totally irrational. I think it was opinion. A pickup is not the same as, I don't know how much a fire engine weighs, but it's a hell of a lot more than a fifth wheel behind a three quarter ton pickup. I believe that came from the fire department, right? That, that conversation you're talking about? Well, it was an email with whoever at the town hall. I think it came from um, the department. So anyway, you do have the right to require that they put a fence between their property and Jana's property. And I would request that you make that a condition of approving, if you choose to approve, that they put a fence up between the property along the entire property line to keep people from crossing over. Thank you. Anybody else? I think, I think he was before you. Are you going to let her go? OK. No, I guess she's letting you go. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to speak. Well, I'm not a resident. William McGrath. Bill, Bill McGrath. We could, Bill McGrath. Okay. Um, I don't own property in town. The only reason I came is I noticed a article in the Keene Sentinel. I don't know anything about this campground. What I can tell you are some facts on Forest Lake because I own property on Forest Lake. And I know firsthand how it, the campground has affected property owners and the lake very negatively. 
We have 150 campsites, and we have approximately 100 property owners. So the campers are more, there's more campers on our lake than property owners. One of the biggest problems we have is with boats. There's over 35 boats. And I have seen anchored out in our lake, and I think your lake is about the size of our lake. I have seen 12 to 16 boats from the campground anchored all over the lake. And in some cases, they're rafting. What rafting is, is you get two, three, four boats all together. And sometimes they're within sight of my I just have to tell you that. I don't know how relevant this is for our lake. I don't know if there's rafting going on at Swansea Lake. You're looking for facts. I can give you facts. You're giving me facts for Forest Lake. You're not giving me facts for Swansea Lake. Boats, I'm talking boats and lakes. And how boats affect lakes. And your lake is about the size of our lake. Okay. And, and our, on our lake, the skiers and the tubers have a hard time, especially on weekends, navigating around these boats. And there are so many boats sometimes parked out in the lake with the music turned up, it sounds like I'm on Hampton Beach. If I wanted a property on Hampton Beach, I'd be over there. I want a quiet place on a lake to retire. And that's what I'm not getting. I've also, very sure, a camper broke into my cottage and stole my property. I have seen campers on my property and other neighbor properties trespassing on property. I don't know if this campground, many campgrounds, the campers have golf carts. I've seen golf carts drive down a town road, which is illegal. I've seen golf carts on my property trespassing. That happens. That's a fact. Um, I need you to move it along a bit. Again, this is irrelevant to us. We have another agenda item after this, so if you could sum it up a bit. Okay. The campground, we get noise that's 680, 800 feet away. And I feel sorry for these neighbors that are living next to the campground. And it will negatively affect their property values. And I heard what happened on the ZBA in that decision with the court. I'm on the ZBA in Winchester. I know the rules and the guidelines. And courts don't like to overturn ZBA decisions. They leave it up to the local authority. And that's probably why the appeal lost. But So basically, I guess those are the facts I wanted to make you aware of before you make your decision. And, and you can put in certain regulations. One other thing I've seen our planning board do is require or, or get input from the fire chief and the town road agent. And I've seen them at some of the planning board meetings. So they've been present while the hearings were taking place. So you can request that of your officials. I don't know if this helps or not, but if I were sitting there, I'd be pretty upset. Thank you. Thank you. Vicki Scalera, 33 Lake Street. Um, I'd like to say, first of all, sorry guys, that I think your presentation was very thorough and I appreciate that you had the answers. My question to the planning board in terms of facts are, would you consider the quality of the water that has been, if you look at the reports and you get them from uh, Swansea Lake and from Wilson Pond, you can see that they are deteriorating. So I would think that that's a fact and I would think that possibly more people would have a negative effect on that. that that's all. I don't know what other uses could be used for the land and if this is better, I just would think that you should consider that. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the public? Anything different on this? Mr. Fipper, do you have something to... Um, okay, not Mr. Fipper. Okay. 
I just want to ask one question. If property value wasn't a concern, then why did the applicant ask her to dismiss herself? I think it's because her husband is one of the ones who wrote that letter, and, and that's a conflict. But if it doesn't matter, is it a conflict? It, the subject is irrelevant. The, the, okay, thank you. <laughs> yep. Okay, thank you. Ah, an old face, huh? Mark Scalera, 33 Lake Street. So, Mark Scalera, 33 Lake Street. So, you know, one of the governing factors of any planning board decision is harmony and compatibility, right? It's it's written in your guidelines. It's it's a very important factor. It's important not only to this project but to a lot of projects that go on in this community. Okay, so. There should be, I think, more effort, at least from where I sit, on trying to come up with solutions to some of the problems, okay? So the last gentleman who recommended a fence between a commercial venture and a residential um, property, I think that's real, okay? I think that's important, okay? Um, and you guys should really consider it. Uh, there was a couple of examples also today here, uh, Chair, where you, said that's, that's not, not fact, fact, right? We need facts. Uh, the, throwing out the Winchester property um, depreciation, right? Um, the facts that you're looking for, and you say, well, that's Winchester, that's not Swansea, or that's Forest Lake, that's not, you know, Swansea. The facts you're looking for is when it's too late. Okay, when the property value has actually been reduced. It's too late. When the water quality has been reduced, it's too late. Okay, I'm looking at a bunch of intelligent people on the board, in the room here. Common sense needs to be applied more, in my opinion. Okay, you don't want it to be too late. So request. In a, a professional assessment of what the campground more closer to this property will do. Get an assessment of what the impact is going to be on the use of the lake. Don't wait until it's too late, okay? This is, this is characteristics of other decisions that we're dealing with. If you wait until it's too late, Didn't you make a bad decision? It's too late. So when you say we want to base it on facts, I'm not sure what you're talking about. And, and the gentleman read there pointed out some things that a lot of people in this room have been thinking for a hell of a lot of hearings, OK? Figure out how to get the facts before you make the decision. That's, That's my, my opinion. opinion. Okay. okay. Yep. I don't know what else I have here. No. As for the potential overuse of the lake, what options are available to you to get better facts? What I'm asking the board. You know, what options are available to you? Uh, you'll have to. I don't exactly know what you mean. Well, uh, the, the quality of the water, the impact from from you know additional septic, additional uses. Uh, the, the impact on people's livelihood, you know, you know, is there options available to you to, to get facts before it's too late? I, I still don't understand your question, what you're asking of me, so well, maybe one of the other board members does. Yeah, I'm not sure you'll ever understand, um, but maybe some of the other board members do. It should be. Yes. In response to the question, and you're not going to like the answer, that's all right. We could ask the Board of Selectmen to ban motorcraft on the lake. Okay. Yeah. Some people would like that and some people wouldn't, right? Like any decision, but yeah. So anyway, I think I made some points, so. Thank you. 
Okay, and anyone, anyone have any? Oh yeah, Mr. Fippard was waiting up there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the waiver that I requested. Um, the section of roadway that exceeds the 8% maximum permitted is this section. So if I can't get a waiver and the board decides I have to build it in compliance with that standard, then I'll be forced to come and revise the plan because it won't stop the project. We'll revise the plan to comply. But I want you to understand what that means. In order to lower the grade over this 200 foot distance um, from 10% to 8%, I would have to cut this end of the roadway down four feet and then keep it a uniform grade. In order to do that, obviously I have to excavate that area to lower it. That means I have to widen the area so I can transition back into the campsite. That means cutting more trees, a lot more disturbance that I felt was contrary to a different part of your regulations, which in your subdivision regulations, it says that we should try to work with the natural terrain and cause the least disturbance possible. As a site planner doing this for 47 years, I feel that it was in the best interest of the town of Swansea and Swansea Lake to minimize the disturbance in this area. But if the board is going to force me to disturb more land areas, so be it. I just want you to understand what you're asking. So I chose not to go to the 8% because I wanted to minimize the disturbance, minimize the tree cutting. And that's what my clients asked me to do. So I understand the waiver um, request is to be approved by the town road agent and the fire chief. And, but I felt I should still list it in the planning board application. So you're fully aware of what I'm asking you to approve. So going to 8% as a maximum grade in this area greatly increases the impact, will increase runoff, will cause more trees to be cut and disturbed. Um, and I think that's inappropriate. We're trying to keep the site as natural as possible. And I think that that was more important than the 2% grade change. OK, thank you. Any board members have anything to add with that? No. Sure. You said something earlier that I realize I'm sitting here I don't understand. You, you said the grant assessment findings, according to the Southwest Regional Planning Board, have no regulatory weight. Could you explain what that means? It means that it's, uh, we'll say, it's not a regulation. Like uh, a zoning ordinance is a regulation. What's in there, uh, you have to abide by. Gotcha. So that, according to Southwest, has no regulatory authority, meaning you can't force someone to do something because it, it is in that study or whatever it's going to be. Right, right. Okay. So, so then, so, so this grant is going to look at phosphorus levels, nitrogen levels, the quality of current septic systems, uh, runoff into the lake, um, environmental loads. And what I asked for was just don't approve this expansion now. Let's wait and get the, the, the data from the, from the results of the assessment. So if the assessment finds that around the, say around the campground, there's lots of phosphorus and there's lots of nitrogen. And that wasn't known yet. This will have no bearing. Uh, you asked what question? What, what was it you asked about? Sure. So I understand that it doesn't have any regulatory weight. Mm -hmm. What I'm asking you to do is wait until you guys allow us to wait until the grant is done. We find out what is the health of the area around the campground. After that comes in, you could then say, yes, we'll grant the expansion or not. I, I'm confused as to why this whole no, it's wait, uh, ag guys. again it, it goes on the opinion and no it's not opinion it's going to be scientific fact 
No, I, I don't mean that. I mean the opinion of Southwest, and I have it here. I can read it out. No, no, I, I understand that it's got no regulatory it. weight. I'm just telling yep. you that you're going to get a bunch of scientific data that will say, hey, campground's really clean. Let them build more. Right? But you might find out that they're saying campground's really kind of skanky. And if you do do this, it's going to get skankier. And it's going to really have a negative impact on, on, on the lake. So why can't you just wait? A question for you. How long is this grant and study going to take place? How long? When would it be done? Sure. Um, I believe, I'm not 100% sure of this, that we will have the data in October. There's one problem. We're on a time constraint, too. We have to make a decision within 65 days of the application. I know that. By law. I know, no, no, I know that. So we can't continue it that long. No, I'm asking you to... I know you can't wait that long. I'm asking, as a, as a number of people who have here said, it's a little, use a little common sense. You know, we're looking at the, the health of the lake. You have the power. Thank you. Thank you. A couple of follow-up comments. Someone just said that the, the decision has to be made in 60 days. That's not true. The applicant can be, uh, ask for an extension. So this yeah, he can is, he can extend it, but we can't. Only the applicant. We could ask the applicant to extend it, the applicant but we can can't. Ask, the applicant asked for an extension, so this doesn't have to be decided in 60 days, as it was just claimed. It does, unless the applicant grants us an extension, which he probably would not. Well, well that, is that a fact or is that an opinion? I've never, yeah. I've never seen one extend them yet. I've seen them. As I said earlier, I've served on a planning board for more than 10 years in the Hampshire town, and I've seen it routinely. With that, I'd also like to comment, having served on a planning board, I respect the, uh, the time that this board is putting in to not only looking at this application, but all of the applications. No, you guys don't get paid for this. You're giving your time to improve the town as best you can. With that as a preface, I direct my next comments to the chair and not to the rest of the board. When did you make up your mind? I don't hear you, no, you uh, divorce data, divorce information and in saying that's conjecture. You ignored data that came from, comes from another place that easily can be extrapolated to this application. You you discount data when, in a way that I simply don't understand, because there's no regulatory authority. That, to me, data is data. And you, you're leaning towards not waiting for data. So you are continuing to claim that things aren't based on data. And the one opportunity you have to, to collect data, you're ignoring or discounting or certainly get to suggesting that you're not going to wait. I find that bizarre. And again, I direct my comment at the chair, not at the rest of the planning board. Thank you. Thank you. So before you get up, just have a seat there for a minute. This is from Lisa Murphy of Southwest Regional. Uh, and this is to Jeffrey, Jeffrey Lapid. And she says, thanks for sharing this. Hi, Jeff, thanks for sharing this. While I share your feelings of less development around the lake, this plan, I mean, this plan development should not be a factor in the planning board's decision. This is a plan that takes into consideration the current conditions and the build-out conditions for future development. While I am not an attorney, it seems that a denial based on this could harm the decision and set the town up for an expensive lawsuit. This is a plan that will not carry any regulatory authority. The planning board must make their decision based on the zoning ordinances and not a plan of this nature. That's that's what we have from her on this. So, yes, sir. Well, it's from the person from Southwest. Yes, sir. So, I want to go back to this. You guys got to act in 65 days or whatever it is. But as I read your rule, um, you can go to the select board and ask for a 90-day extension. It says it's right there in number three. That, that was done away with last session for the legislator last year. It 
it's still in your rules. Yeah, but it's none of the RSAs is what he's saying, that the, the state says you can't do it anymore. So the state says it has to happen in 65 days? Okay. If, oh, yes, sir. Quick, quick clarification, Bruce Bergstrom again. So the 10% gray road that they want, that's a new road being cut in? It's an internal road in internal the site. Road. That's not, not, that, not it, there now. It's not the driveway, right? Okay, yeah, because the road agent did not give an opinion on that, whether that was acceptable or not. No, and um, just the driveway, because that's not the driveway. He gave an opinion on the driveway. Right. And that's, that's where his jurisdiction right. but I still ends. think it should be a 5%. I mean, I know he, threat, he basically thre he threatened you with doing all sorts of terrible he things. He just brought it to right. our attention. I don't call it a threat, but go ahead. All right. Well, all right. I guess that's opinion. All right. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Anybody else have anything new? Is it new? Okay. Well, I understand now what you meant by regulatory, and I knew that Lisa said you guys would be open to a lawsuit. That's not new to me. Well, maybe you should take on the lawsuit and think of the lake. Because just because it's going to be a lawsuit doesn't mean you don't want to fight for the lake. You can say, well, we don't want to take a chance because we're going to get sued. Or you could say, I'd rather be invested. Or you can take the chance and get sued and have it go through anyway. Right. right. It depends. It's like the guy said earlier, you know, it seems like the money. Okay. okay. Well, thank you. thank you. Anyone else have anything else new for this site plan? If not, we're getting ready to close the public hearing. Any of the board members have any objection or have any thoughts on closing the public hearing? If not, yes. Go ahead. This is your last chance before we close the public hearing, because when the public hearing is closed, we don't take any more testimony from the public, or the applicant for that matter. I do appreciate everyone making the recommendation for a fence if you guys do choose to approve it, because obviously there is transient people that are going to go back and forth on my property. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Fibbert, uh with the... Um, Campground owners consider putting a fence up between that property line? Yes. Yes? Yes. yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Would the campground consider putting up a green fence satisfactory to the budding property owner? Uh, leave it up to her to pick the fence? No. A, a green fence. We'll put up a security fence six feet high. Um, it'll probably be chain link. I would recommend vinyl coated. It could be a green could be a green color. I mean, no, I'm talking about a, a living fence, shrubbery. Oh. Um, Wood stockade fence. I would prefer not to do wood stockade fence because they only last a few years. Um, there's a lot of maintenance involved with them. They deteriorate too rapidly. Um, vinyl coated chain link fence is probably going to last 20 years. In that location. How long do you think the wood fence would last? Maybe five. That's it? Five years? I mean, we do stockade fencing on a lot of projects that, um, I mean, I've done this so long, I just recommend against it because it requires so much maintenance. They look bad. If a, the boards come loose, they fall off. It's just not a good quality fence. I mean, she wants it to be secure and difficult for somebody to get over it and get into her property. Mm -hmm. And I understand right. that. I, I would recommend six foot high chain link. Okay. Um, board members, any questions would on that? Would the applicant be willing to uh, plant some coniferous trees that I know you had asked about arbovitis not being uh, required? More like a natural pine tree to shield the fence from the applicant and to block some of the noise and sights. Um, I guess where would we put the, the green fence that we're talking about? Um, the area is already forested, so if I'm planting underneath in the shaded areas, it's going to be difficult for them to thrive. You know, 
open sunny location, they do thrive. I use arborvitaes on my own property. I planted them five years ago, and now they're already over 10 feet tall, they're doing really well because it's sunny and open. In a shaded area, they're not going to do it. I mean, we could, we could add plants like rhododendron, which do okay in a shadier environment. Um, they hold their leaves throughout the year, and that may be, be something. I think we would be open to that if the board felt that'll help alleviate the concerns. Thank you. And you're talking in place of a fence or in, in addition to a fence? Um, in addition to the fence. Okay, that's what I thought. I'm just clarifying that. So I guess you could just give me a little more detail what you're looking for. Am I putting up a fence and then trying to hide the fence? Or am I putting up a fence with a green backdrop behind it so it's a more effective shield looking through the fence? Yeah, I was thinking, uh, say, 20 or 30 feet behind the maintenance building, the width of that would block the, uh, the camping areas. You okay, know, so that so if somebody were looking through the forest, they wouldn't see the white campers and the blue so, tarps and all that. So you're looking at this area to the right of the maintenance building. Yeah. Uh, because this, there was, it was thinner vegetation in this area. We could see that at the site. Correct. And then the further to the um, west we went, the thicker it got. So, so you're looking at this area to the right, enough to screen the uh, closest camping site. And I think the uh, natural pine tree, hemlock kind of uh, plant would grow in that area like it has. Or a mix of plants, hemlock and juniper yeah. and rhododendron. And it might be a benefit to the campground too. Okay. You finished up there? I'm done. Okay. okay. Any board members have a question on that? If the applicant shouted from the uh, grandstand over here uh, that she would prefer a picket fence, could that be done so that the picket fence faces the campground rather than her property because there are slats going across to hold the pickets on and that just provides a ladder for people to climb over? Usually, yes, but one of the problems is trespassers. And if you have the uh, bedside facing the neighbor, because there are slats going across it, that can provide for a ladder for someone to climb over it. So she would get the benefit of the um, fence without the ladder effect. So you're asking Ms. Blake that, right? Yes. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right. So, yes, if we're talking a fence, I would not like a chain link fence because that's climbable. I've climbed many of them in my life. Um, and if, <laughs> stating a point, that is a fact. Um, <laughs> but if it is going to be a stockade fence, I would, I understand what you're saying, where the bad side of the fence or whatever would be on facing me because it's just going to be straight wood that they can't climb over unless they can grab a hold of it and yank themselves over so it would be harder to do and i would also appreciate to have that blocked off with some sort of green shrubbery as well i mean that would screen my side as well as keep my property more protected from people coming back and forth and also just Make it so I wouldn't have to see quite so many campers and blue tarps and just less less of a bad view. I think the shrubbery was was on the camp side of the or the campground side of the fence is what they were talking about. Closer to where those camping areas are could be either way. Well, it could be either way then I guess. Would you would you, would you be willing to have the stockade fence be like in line with the back of the maintenance building so that that maintenance building would act as a fence and then have fence on either side and then have the green. I want it extended far enough where people are going to be discouraged to go find the end of the fence and walk around it. 
That what is what was Bush's is next to the fence? Sly, you're talking about. But I the, understand you're saying the back of the maintenance building would be like the beginning of the fence and then it would radiate out from each side. That's what you mean. Yeah, I think you mean back And then far. you'd have 100 feet of buffer to plant the trees that would shield the fence from you and the maintenance building. I, yes. I agree. Mr. Pepper, does that make sense? I, yeah, I understand. So, stockade fencing is the preferred fencing. The finished side of the fence, about the slats, faces the campground. And the fence would extend from the end of the maintenance building um, going east. Um, it can go a ways. Forget the length of the property line. But we would extend it far enough and down the hill. Um, this area gets wet at the bottom, and I think that's enough to discourage people from wandering around. And then in this direction, we would go to the property line. And then there would be vegetation planted on vegetation the other side. Planted of it. on the east side, mm -hmm. on the abutter side of the fence. The abutter side, yeah. Right, a mix of vegetation, okay. hemlock, rhododendrons, junipers. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what that would be. That's what you're talking about, correct? Yeah, okay. Anybody else, board members, on that? That sounds like a fair solution to that problem there, and the applicant has agreed to it. So if that were to be put on as a condition, then a drawing would have to be presented to the board at a compliance hearing if that were a condition, because that's a compliance issue right there. Uh, Ms. Blake? I just would like to add that I am still totally against this being approved. Yep, we get that by now. I definitely do not want it approved, okay. but I would like this considered as a factor mm -hmm. if you do choose to do so. Okay, thank you. Any board members, anybody object to closing the public hearing? If not, then I will close the public hearing and being closed, we will accept no more testimony from the applicant or from uh, the public. Now we can deliberate. We have plenty, and Jane, you are not part of the del deliberations because you have recused yourself. Yeah, we do, right? We got five, yeah, we got one, two, three, four, five, yeah. She's not part of the deliberations because she's recused. Yeah, so we have five, five members. So, so what does everyone think? I'm just looking for it because they have to have uh, NHDES uh, subsurface approval for the septic, and they have to have an NHDES subdivision approval, and that would be a condition if it were to be approved. And also, let's see, a, a condition to keep the 100-foot buffer left in its natural state, I would say, should be on there. Um, you know, they only have to have the 20-foot setback there, but they're showing in the drawing that it's 100 feet from the property line, so, uh, and they say it's going to be kept in natural state, so that should be a condition of the site plan if it goes through, that that, 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 that be kept, that 100-foot feet foot buffer be kept in its state rather than the 20-foot buffer. Uh, let's see, also to certify that the septic system, and that's the old one on the west side of East Shore Road, old original one, be certified. Well, let's see, and of course we just talked about the fence. So, it, was that going to be, merging the properties, that was going to be um, a condition? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, then good, thank you. It was, they had brought up in their original uh, application that uh, a condition to merge the two properties that they have there 
it's the property that the extension is going to be on, do away with that center property line, I guess you'd call it, and merge it with the one to the west that they own there. Now, let's see. All right, so conditions that would require a compliance hearing would be a plan showing the plantings and the fence uh, that was just discussed. They'd have to come back for a compliance hearing and have that shown on a drawing where that's got to be. Now, the other ones, let's see, there was the 100-foot buffer. That's already shown on the plan, but that's going to still be conditioned. That's not a compliance certification of the septic system. That does not require a compliance hearing. That's the administrative. Uh, let's see. Administrative, also the NHDES uh, subsur uh, subsurface approval and the subdivision approval. That would also be a condition, but does not have to be brought in front of us on a compliance hearing. Anybody else have anything? Mr. There? Chairman? Yes. With respect to the fence, I'd like it clear that that would be at the applicant's expense, and the applicant is to maintain that fence in good condition. Maintained in good condition. Yep. yep. Anything else from the board members there? Did we cover? I think we covered all of the conditions if it were to be approved. Anybody else think of anything? Sly? Anything? No. Michael? Brandon? Steve? We're all set? Okay. Then if that's the case, a motion would be in order. And just let me list the conditions first here. I want to organize them out here. The conditions that do not require a public uh, hearing, which would be a compliance hearing, would be an NHDES subsurface approval for the septic, NHDES subdivision approval, certification of the old septic system on the west side of East Shore Road, and and merge the properties. That's the last one we're looking at. And merge the two properties. Did I leave any out? And we have one condition, if that were the condition, I mean, for it to be approved, and that's the compliance hearing for the, uh, the plan showing, yeah, plan showing plantings and the fence going from their maintenance building out easterly and out westerly and plantings in front of it. That's a compliance hearing. That's the only thing I can think of that we had for conditions for a compliance hearing. Anyone else think anything else for a compliance hearing? Sarah? You did miss keep the 100 foot buffer in the natural state and maintain the fence in good condition. Okay, and that would be. I, I don't believe you there goes uh, compliance. I think they're in the it's first list. Just in the condition of the uh, administrative, but that's right, I left those out. Okay, anyone have anything else to add or discussion? If not, then a motion is in order. Anybody want to make a motion? Or? I'll move that to accept it with those uh, compliance hearings. A motion to approve the site plan with the conditions that I had already stated. Is there a second? Oh, I'm sorry, the motion was by Michael York. Is there a second? Seconded by Brandon Self. Is there any further discussion? Then all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? One opposed. Steve opposed. So that would be one, two, three, four, two, three. I mean, four to one. <laughs> okay, so the, it is approved with those conditions. And you'll have to apply for a compliance hearing when you get the drawings ready. You're welcome. Let me move that we do a five minute recess. Five minute recess, okay. Five minute recess. Yep. So we're in a five minute recess, Beverly. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, being
Polish, you're not going to get passed by, so. Like the Buddha. <laughs> yeah, maybe he'd come in now. Yeah. On the dining board there. No, we haven't. No, not yet anyway.
una cantidad de Okay, I'm reconvening the meeting, and our next agenda item is uh, Planning Board Number 23-002, and that's a site plan modification, SVE Associates, on behalf of Moore Tech, uh, Nanotechnology Systems Incorporated, requests a modification to their approved site plan for an approximately 3,280 square foot expansion. Subject property is shown at tax map 19, lots 97-2 and 97-3 and it's located at 230 Old Homestead Highway in the Industrial Park District. And upon finding that the application meets the submission requirements of the site plan review regulations, the board will vote to accept the application as complete and public hearing may follow immediately or will be scheduled for a time and date certain. And you're up, Mr. Hitchcock. Just uh, Bob Yeah, just, just give us what you have on there. Do you have the lit, your list for... Uh, Completeness, I mean, you know, I don't see too much in your hand there, but. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I'll just note that you did ask about the checklist, and he's asking for waiving the landscape plan because that's not changing in the uh, lighting. So. Okay, let's uh, let's accept the application as complete or not complete, and then we'll work on those, through those waivers, and then we'll let him proceed. I'll move that we accept it as complete. Motion by Michael York to accept the application as complete. Seconded by. Second. Seconded by <laughs> him. <Yeah. down> <laughs> It was seconded by Sly Karasinski. Is there any further discussion? And all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, now let's get to the waivers. Before you make your presentation, let's get to the waivers there. And one was a landscape plan, which you're looking for a waiver at. Uh, 
from, and you aren't changing any landscaping there, so that seems like a kind of a no-brainer. Oh, there they are. Thank you. No brainer there. And the other was a location and type and nature of all existing and proposed lighting, which uh, it's it's there with the original site plan that we have on record. So up to the planning board to grant those two uh, exceptions or waivers rather, or not grant them. Motion to to grant the two waivers as requested. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Karazinski. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, that's out of the way. Now you may make your presentation. Thank you. And just for the record, we're on the public hearing. I didn't open it officially, but we're officially open public hearing. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Hitchcock. I thought you might be. It is, yeah. So again, like I said, there's no change in anything else, parking or otherwise, on the site plan. They're filling in that portion of the building that's a jut right now. Uh, it's not taking any parking. It's not taking anything else from there. Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 Yeah, I would say that you are, but still, maybe you'll expand later on. Again. Uh, any questions from Mr. Hitchcock or from the board? Anyone here? Yes, sir. Any other discussion from the public or the board members? That matter, then go ahead. Yep. <laughs> okay, if there's, if there's no further comment, then I will close the public hearing. Any objections to that, board members? Then I am closing the public hearing. Thank you, and we'll deliberate. Well, it's, a, again, very straightforward, very simple. Uh, we know what they're trying to do there, and... Any questions? questions? Any discussion? If not, then a motion. Go ahead, Jane. No, there isn't a motion yet. We're we're looking for just any any comments, any discussion from the board as we're deliberating on this. Uh, if not, then the motion would be in order. A motion by Steve Malone to approve the uh, site plan modification. Is there a second? Seconded by Brandon Self. Is there any further discussion? Then all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. okay. Uh, good luck. Good luck. And okay, that's good there. Now the next, next item up is we have an application for an alternate member, and that would be Victoria Rec Ames has express interest in becoming an alternate to the planning board and I see that she's here tonight she's right over there everyone has everyone read that or seen that and you did okay anybody have any questions for the applicant she's been on the board before I've served with her on the board before So if there, 
no questions for anyone or from anyone, then a motion to, and we, wait a minute, before I do that, what would the term be, Sarah, do you know? Three year or two year? I, I can't remember. I don't recall. Sign her up for Canada. Was this the, the one year one that was open? One well, year, the okay. Stagger, but we have they three do. alternate positions. And right now, Steve has two more years on his. And if something changes, then we'll just change it and we'll all know what the meeting there. So, anybody? Not yet. I'm getting to the motion now. It took it took a moment there, but getting to the motion. So we'll need a motion to accept the application and uh, accept the application for a three-year term for an alternate member of the planning board. Anybody want to make that motion? I'll make the motion. Motion by, let's see, he was louder than you were, so motion by Brandon Self, want to second it? Seconded by Mr. Karaszynski. Is there any further discussion? Then all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Welcome aboard for the second time. <laughs> um, I think the town, town clerk usually does it, but. Yeah, town clerk. Yeah. Has to be the town clerk. Yeah. It usually is town yeah, clerk. Yeah, if you just come by the town hall, the town clerk will swear you. I have to prepare paperwork, so they'll do it tomorrow. I'll send you an email. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah, we had that request for the um, multi-tenant uh, process, change request slash request. And that's been our packet for a little while there. And what they're talking about is making it a little more streamlined so let's see here, we, do everyone have that in front of them? Okay. <coughs> so, get that out of the way. Is there any feedback from staff? Um, staff is in favor of streamlining the multi tenant application request. If not to not to remove the board, but to work in the direction of removing the public hearing component mm -hmm. on applications that are viewed as not impactful, um, because that would reduce the amount of time an applicant needs to wait prior to getting an approval, and it would also reduce the expense on applicants because there wouldn't be the requirement of putting an ad in the paper or sending a certified mailing. We're just talking about like business. We're not talking about different business. Let's see. Is that, is that section 15 in our ordinance? Is it? It's in the site plan, right? Oh, no wonder That's I'm looking at the wrong one. Finding. That's why I'm not finding it there. Because yeah. I know I, I was reading that, and there was something in there. Um, no, I have it right here. Thank you. Yeah, I have it. I think we all have it here. But I, I know that this was a, a week or two ago, a couple weeks ago, probably. I read it through, and I was. I may have made general generic as retail to retail. We want to make sure that we want to be as generic as generic as retail to retail, because in here it says like hairdresser to hairdresser. That makes sense. Dog groomer to dog makes sense. But retail is at large expense. Well, I, I think something to keep in mind with this, regardless of how the regulation is rewritten, if if you guys choose to rewrite it, is that it would still come before the board, and you could determine that staff were wrong in suggesting it was a like business and still require a public hearing. You know, you can you can add that to the regulation so that it you know the, the possibility of a public hearing still exists if if the board determines an application to, to really not be similar. We just want to make sure that the that we aren't leaving the public out of it. The public the, the public hearings, the whole thing about the public hearings is that the public gets a chance to weigh in on what's going in in a business here, if they live next door, or even if they don't live next door. As we know, they've been here, you know, giving us their opinion on stuff. And they like to, as they, that's their right to do. So, 
we d we want to make sure that we don't turn over too much power to the land use or not land use board. I was going to say land use board. That's us. Uh, to the uh, to the staff that um, that the planning board should be deciding on things like that. But I can see if it's an identical building for sure. I mean, identical use in the building, then it makes no sense to make the applicant jump through another hoop, public hearing and all, just to go in that building with the same exact use. But it, maybe it ought to stay at that. It has to be the same exact use or very, very close to it. Otherwise, we would be cutting the public out of that part of their right to, to say something about it. Um, so, uh, if, if somebody were to, if we were to do this, and we'll say, restaurant next to Gamarlo is there, he decides to move out of there and somebody else takes over and opens up a restaurant, he'd go to the town hall and file whatever paperwork with them and they'd declare, okay, yeah, it's just one restaurant leaving and another one coming in. And then they'd say, okay, no need to go through the planning board. Would they still have to um, notify like any abutters or anything like that in that process or would that be overriding all that? That's a good question. It could go either way. If there's not a public hearing, then nobody would be noticed at all. If it's a public hearing, then the butters are noticed. That's the difference between the two. If it's a regular meeting by the planning board, although if, if it's in the town office, then no, it wouldn't be at all. But I don't know that we should uh, should give that up. I don't know that if, if they wanted determination, they could just as easily come to the board uh, on, on a meeting and have the board determine whether it's a, the exact same business or not, and go along with it at a regular scheduled meeting uh, at the planning board. It's on our agenda. It's not a public hearing where you're not noticed, but it's on the agenda that says Joe Blow wants to go into the restaurant by Gamarla store and reads it, you know, as the notice, say, well, yeah, I might want to see what's going on with that. And that would give any abutters the chance. To they could still, still, yeah, it's not a public hearing, but they could still say, well, whatever they'd say. Who knows yeah. what they'd say. But the, the board could also, at that meeting say uh, approve or we should go to public hearing right. that's right the whole that's right but but if we change the subdivision regular I mean I'm not what's going on here. <laughs> plan regulations if we change those regulations it would give the planning board the authority to at that meeting say yeah that's the exact same business going in there we don't need a public hearing and have at it good luck or the other way but I don't know if we ought to give the authority to the town, the, to the staff, nothing against the staff, but I'm just saying the public would not really be informed until they're already in there. Go ahead, Jane. I'm thinking of the building where Swansea Oil uses water. Yep. And how that really changed for the better, but we did hear a lot of talk about it too. They came and got the permit when it changed the name of it. And that's, that's a place where there are several. Same exact. Mm -hmm. It could be replaced. Yeah. That's right. There are, yeah, like that, that turnover, you're right. Yeah. 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 Mr. Chairman? Yes. What if, okay, you've got a hairstylist. Mm -hmm. And argument's sake, there are three chairs in the facility. And the new owner or the new applicant wants to put in a fourth chair. Is that come before us or not? I would say we would have to. But again, if it were before the board at a regular meeting, that could be all hashed out then. You could see the drawing of what they had inside, whether they had room for it or not. You know, it could be up to the code enforcement. Well, it would be up to code enforcement also if there's room in there, but at least it'd give the planning board a chance to look at it and say, yep, or no. So basically, you get a set of plans and maybe ask one or two questions without a public hearing and then make more decisions as to whether or not it needs a public hearing. Yeah. yeah. That's, and that is what we're talking about, to streamline a little bit for businesses. You know, we want businesses to, to thrive in Swansea. You know, that's, they're good for the tax base. They don't, you know, put too much on the services and they offer tax to us. Jane, do you have a question? Oh, okay. You can't raise the hand. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but we have two, two different things in there. You know, we're talking about multi-tenant and we're talking about new tenant. Now we have a provision in here with the new tenant one. The new tenant one is is the exact same business, right? Let's see, probably uh, the dog groomer, hairstylist, yeah, stylist, new tenant.
Yeah. yeah. Hey Mike. Hey Mike. So I completely understand it. Just a second. Just a second, Mike. Can you hear him, Beverly? No. Would you move the phone down there by Beverly? Can you? Just a second, Mike. Oh yeah. Yeah. Let's try. We're putting you by the microphone here. Try it. Hello? Okay, yeah. Would you just start over, please, Mike? Sure, absolutely. It's, it's all too often these these multi-tenants where we're seeing people coming in and A, having to pay hundreds of dollars and B, having to wait weeks sometimes to get their, you know, a barely, a really basic application heard. Uh, when you look at the multi-application buildings that we have in town, when you look at the Pinning Building, the Trahan Building, and, and those, I mean, you know, it took it took almost five weeks for, for uh, um, uh, oh my goodness gracious! The the, 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 the nonprofit that, that builds houses, <laughs> Jimmy Carter's pro pet project. Habitat. Help me, folks. Habitat for Humanity. Thank you. Habitat for Humanity moved into Penny's building, where they lose, where they were going to use it for four hours a week. You know, it cost them a hundred and something dollars, and it took a month to get the actual approval for them to just go in. And set up for four hours a week and that seemed to me to be you know extreme now i have no desire to to put somebody in there to you know if, if for a second i thought that you know a company or a a, a, a business was something that people were going to really want to talk about we want to put it in there but when we look at our multi-family or multi-tenant buildings um I just don't see that happening often. They're just, they're, they're, they're small, they're simple structures, and they can only handle what they can handle. We're talking about hairstylists. We've had frame, uh, frame rate companies. Um, the most controversial one actually had to go through the, the, uh, the select board. Uh, it was a tattoo parlor in the Trahan building, and that was because we had uh, an ordinance uh, regarding tattooing, um, and that had to go through them. I've never really had a problem with the planning board, which is, nor, nor, nor has a, as a tenant that I can recall. It's just the time and the money put in. Um, you look at a penny building. We basically have one, maybe two neighbors, and they're so desensitized to getting these notices. I mean, I've heard from both of them. They don't even open the mail. Um, they're simple spaces. They can only take simple, uh, simple operations, uh, hearing aids, hairdressers, accountants, um, very, very basic stuff. So, you know, it, it, this is really done in an absolute, and I know the chair knows this, and I'm sure the select board uh, also appreciates the fact, this is done in the interest of just trying to help people get their businesses up and running uh, as fast as possible in the town of Swansea. Uh, Keene does not have such a thing, and I start to worry about, if we're doing something Keene's not, I start to worry about, well, if they're not doing it, then, 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 then why are we? So. Um, that's kind of where I am. I, I appreciate your time. I do. I know it's been a long night, and uh, I'll, I'll stop there. I have a question for you, Mike. Yeah. Going from a, uh, using a hairstylist, going from a hairstylist to a barbershop or vice versa, how does that play into this? Well, I mean, for, for me, they're, 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 they're one and the same. I would, I would actually, at great risk, I would actually stretch that out, Mr. Malone, to saying a hairstylist to a barbershop to an accountant is the same as to, an, as to a, uh, a financial consultant. I mean, they're, they're, they're simple professional services that are pretty non-controversial. I, I don't, you know, I mean, that's, you know, it, it's really that simple from, from where I stand from the, the, the applications we receive. And, and of course, this is brought forward to you based on experience and based on, on, on how we feel that we're best able to serve the, the, the community. I mean, we're, we would be taking on a certain amount of responsibility at this stage. And I understand that the same as we did with the signs and the same as we have with home occupation and the others. And so far, I think it's going, it's, it's going quite well. Again, Scott's um, uh, 
uh, comment is a is a good one. And 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 when would when 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 would I say, hey, you know, the select board, the uh, planning board should really hear this? Well, that's a good question. When when would they have to hear this? And chances are, it would be something that would be kind of rubbing up against uh, the zoning ordinance. Quite frankly. <coughs> Okay there, Mike? Yeah, a little bit of a cough. I'm good. Thank you, sir. So you're saying you could substitute a similar business as opposed to an identical business? What I'm, what I'm saying is that's how I view it. How it actually happens is, is ultimately up to the planning board, which is why, why we're here in front of you. So the whole bottom line is that we want to streamline possibly streamline this process just to make it easier for businesses to go into a multi-tenant or as a new tenant. And personally, I'd be all in favor of not requiring the public hearing because that's where the time is involved there and the noticing and the expense and all that type of stuff. But I still would be in favor of the applicant just coming in front of the board on a regularly scheduled meeting to discuss it and just show us a little bit of what they're doing there and let the planning board right then and there either approve it or say no um we'll have to have you come back for a public hearing that's that's the way i okay thank you retail retail well not all retail is similar we have to make that determination here if there are similar businesses or not Mm -hmm. So it should be a part of a select review so I believe that. It should be, but but I agree with him. It should be able to be done in one meeting meeting. Yeah. You know, just yeah. approved and, and have at it. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I'm in favor of that. So we can uh, maybe work on rewording that yeah. a little bit. We'll add that to the pile of the site plan. Okay, great. <laughs> great. Yeah, we, right, because we have a lot to go through with the site plan review. We've been amending it for a while, which is fine. That's, that's yeah, what we, we do. Yeah, another week to sit there. Well, we have it on the agenda for every meeting, just in case we've got time to, to speak about it, and, and we can get it little by little done. And Sarah's done a, done a bunch of work on it so far, and this is, it came at the right time. This is just what we're doing with our site plan regs, so I think we could do that in there. Uh, we also had, I think we're done with that, are we? Okay, Sarah's going to work on that. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, rules of procedure amendments. Do we want to do that? And we've been working on those for a while, too. Um, and we. We probably should do something about those, and they aren't very long. I don't know if everyone has a copy of it. I have a copy of it someplace. Um, I have copies. I have a new memo I made for everybody on these in case we got to it tonight, which I wasn't sure if we would. I have my copy somewhere. Here we are. This memo includes all of the changes for HB 1261 that we discussed last September, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. A couple of simple, I don't know, errors and inconsistencies that existed in the regulations, as well as one provision that um, you all have not seen yet, so I want to draw your attention to that. Um, and the existing regulations are the last couple pages of this memo, including, you know, red line edits and such. Um, but the part I'd like to bring your attention to is on the second to last page on the back side of decisions. So, yeah, I see several of you have it open. And it's the reconsideration, appeal, and court review of planning board decisions. Yeah. Um, I took the language for this directly from the, uh, is it DEA that produces the, the planning board guidebook? Is it, well, whoever, I think you guys know the document I know document what you mean, and I have, the, I have that, well, I don't have it here, but yeah, I know the document yeah. you mean. Um, I took their section from that to, to put under our decision section. Um, just so that we actually have a provision in the rules for um, what's happening right now with mm -hmm. uh, the Plainview project. 
Yep, we should have it in there. I agree. And then I added a page that Julius found from knowing the territory that cites case law that supports having that provision. Yep, and that we can do it. So good. Yep, we should add that in there. And so I don't want to be like, okay, everybody, give me a decision tonight. But what I would like to do is set a public hearing to approve these in February, if possible, after you've all had sufficient time to review. So we don't need to set a date tonight, but my goal is that we would have this implemented by the second meeting in February. I mean, not second, it would be the third meeting in February. Because we have that special meeting on the second, and then we have the ninth, and then we have the 23rd. Yeah. So yeah, so if we can get this done by February, then we can get all our comments together on the 19th, and then we can have a meeting on the 20th. And then Sarah can put them together for the 23rd. We get the public hearing on the 23rd. So that sounds like a good plan. Then we'll actually get it done, rather than just talking about it, which we have been doing. So let's figure for that. Will anybody having comments on the February 9th meeting, we'll discuss it then. Hopefully we'll have time to discuss it. And I'll add one more thing. I've also included the full version of what's recommended by the state or by DEA in that document. So you guys don't have to incorporate anything from this, but if you all give it a review, you might find things that you feel make sense for Swansea to have included. So that's the public to see? Yes. There's a lot in there, but just keep in mind that sometimes simpler is better. Sometimes we don't want to restrict ourselves with specific rules and laws that we have in there that can trip us up later on. So while we're reviewing it, just keep that in mind too. Yeah, sometimes when I write new legislation, the guy that comes up with the idea is not the one that writes it. They go to an attorney and committee and they put all kinds of language in there. They kind of have to there though, about legislation there. They don't have to. That's just what the lawyers choose to do to make it more confusing. But these are our own rules of procedure. So, you know, if we put something in there that's arbitrary or that we let slip by or something, then they're going to come up to the podium and say, well, in your rules of procedure, it says, and you've got to abide by it. So we don't want to handcuff ourselves or tire. Many times that's happened already. But I'm just saying, keep it in mind when you're reading that stuff over. So let's see. We've got rules of procedures. Want to call it a night? Yeah, we have site plan review regulations, but I suppose we could go to any other business. We could skip that one for now. Go to any other business that may be required. Anybody else have any other business? Anybody? I guess not too many people left out there. So ready for you. Nobody else has anything else in a motion for adjournment by Steve. Is there any second for a motion for adjournment? Second by Brandon Self. Is there any further discussion? And all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye.